The Corona Commission report recommended increasing communication across racial lines to destroy stereotypes. On a 1991 episode of Detroit Black Journal, a panel of African Americans in local media talked about the stereotypical images of blacks that were prevalent in the news, in film, and in advertising. In 68, we've had a tremendous influx of blacks in the media, the mainstream media, as well as the black media. Well, Has it had any impact at all? Um, certainly it's had some impact. It has sensitized newsrooms, uh, more or less, and I'm, I'm one of those that thinks less. But, but let's remember that when you say a tremendous influx, uh, by my, the, the latest survey I saw means that the number of blacks employed by the so-called major media has grown from 2% in newsrooms to just under 7%. That, in my judgment, is not a tremendous inf influx particularly in major markets like Detroit, where there's such a large minority population. Let me bring Robert McTyre into the Michigan Chronicle. You see your role as trying to correct that imbalance? Absolutely. Um, and I want to kind of tag on to what, what Bill mentioned, too. I think, too, that, that there is a polarization that has taken place in, in newsrooms uh, in this country uh, in the last 20 years. And I think that the black press now more than ever has a significant role in providing an, an image, a perception of what exists in the black community and the things that go on that is not clearly sometimes covered in what's called the majority media. Um, <clears throat> and I think another thing is, is that you have to recognize in Detroit, for instance, the, the percentage of black population that's uh, over 70 percent. So obviously when there are reports of crime, which is the bread and butter, of the news media, fires and, and killings and that sort of thing. Obviously, blacks are featured in those because we are the majority population. The Michigan Chronicle has been a voice of the African American community here since 1936. Joining me now is the newspaper's associate publisher and chief operating officer, Kathy Ned. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So as I said there, the Chronicle's been around since 1936. That's way before 1967 uh, and before 1968. I'm curious. And before I was born. And before, yes. well, <laughs> <laughs> of course it was. Uh, I'm curious, though, whether the things that happened here in 1967 changed the way that the Chronicle saw its role in Detroit and sort of maybe asked a little more of the Chronicle in terms of being that voice, not just to the African-American community, but the voice of the African-American community to the majority community? Um, I don't think it changed. I think it enhanced uh, what it was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, 1967 riots, of course, they covered it in 1971. Remember, we had the riots in Attica, and mm -hmm. the Michigan Chronicle was credited as being part of the group that helped to settle that. It also supported uh, Mayor Young quite fiercely, mm -hmm. as well as the labor unions and the uh, Democratic Party. So I think it just made them realize that we really have to have a voice even more so yeah. now than before. Yeah, uh, I, I can remember people when I was a kid referring to the, the Chronicle as the green sheets, yes. right? Uh, ba harkening back to the time when uh, you paper. went from town to town and, and read them because that was where you could find accommodations, right? Hotels that would, uh, that would rent a room to you or restaurants that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't put you out. That's a really different role, of course, than the Chronicle plays now uh, in a society where segregation is no longer legal but still kind of with us uh, in lots of ways. Talk about what role you see the Chronicle playing uh, today in Detroit. Well, we look at ourselves really <coughs> as telling the stories that mainstream media don't readily tell. Mm -hmm. We pride ourselves in holding up the community um, and really reporting more on the progressive news, the things that people are doing in our community, because they don't often get press in other places. We ask the community to send us stuff that we wouldn't otherwise know about. Yeah. Uh, we don't have our newsroom and our staff isn't as big as the free press and the news, of course, but um, we want the community to help us find out what that news is, and they do. They send that to us. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you feel... Uh, do you feel as though mainstream media, uh, uh, regular, you know, big, big media in this town has changed uh, to be more like uh, 
the Chronicle in terms of the way it sees diversity in the, in the way it sees uh, African American issues. Has, has there been an effect uh, of that presence in that, in that way? I think in some cases they might think so. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to say that we get ignored altogether, but I think it's very important that we tell the stories about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We tell it with the uh, cultural relevance um, that it should have and with the historical backdrop that it should have. So even though they may cover some things, I still think it's very important that we tell it from our angle and look at things that are very important to us and amplify it, yeah. whereas it might be a brief in the daily news. Right, so in that way, uh, black media's importance is not is not changing, even though society is changing. It's becoming more important, I, I think, with the advent of uh, the internet and Facebook. You know, stories get told immediately, mm -hmm. immediately. I mean, sometimes if I'm up late enough, I'll see something uh, get reported on Facebook even before some, in some instances, the <laughs> cops know about it and before the news knows about it. Right. So it's more important now than ever that we get into the story and make sure that the proper comments are being made and, and things aren't always looked at from the wrong point of view. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like uh, some of your role still is to challenge the narrative, uh, the master narrative that's out there uh, and, and put a different a different perspective Absolutely, on it. absolutely, and correct it. Uh -huh. Sometimes correct the narrative, challenge it, put it in into that cultural perspective um, that it should be put in so that other people can see themselves in the news sometimes. Yeah. Um, they don't always see themselves. Something happened recently, uh, one of the judges decided, uh, did the injunction against mm -hmm. the driver's fees. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was so important. I just know too many people, a lot of them black men who, you know, can't get around because of the drivers. And I just think it's unfair. So it was like, we go to press on Tuesday. I'm not really a writer, <laughs> but I found out about it kind of late on Tuesday because um, we go to press that day and I just wrote something up real quick I, and put it on the front page because I thought it was just too important to our community that um, she had done that. And I thought that was very important. I mm -hmm. hope it gets upheld and that th those driver fees are definitely erased. Yeah, it has a different effect in, in it, the black community. It definitely, community I think, has a heavier impact other, on the black other community. Than other places. Uh, quickly, I want to ask you about the narrative in Detroit right now which uh, has changed uh, over the last five or ten years to, to reflect some of the things that are happening uh, in downtown and in midtown, moving the city in a different direction. I've always thought that the Chronicle had a really interesting uh, take on that too, different from the rest of the media. Well, <laughs> we don't always always voice it. I, I mean, it's just unfortunate. I, I, it's a good thing for the city, mm -hmm. um, but in some instances, it's just unfortunate that we aren't playing a larger role in it. Um, we People are being left behind. We are being left behind. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we try to get, interestingly enough, the, the black developers who are involved, mm -hmm. we do try very, sometimes we know about it well before they've inked the deal. We try to get them to talk and they don't want to talk. They feel like if they do talk, it then might- it could be pushed out. It right? could be pushed out. It would jeopardize. So that's, that's unfortunate that we can't go to press when the others can go to press. Yeah. Others go to press when they start thinking about doing something. Right. Um, we can't do that and we honor that I mean, we could take it and say, okay, it's too bad. I know about it. I'm gonna, we, we don't, we yeah. don't. We do honor the fact that they want to stay out and try to get them to let us know about it from their perspective. And I'll tell you, interestingly enough, even once they can talk, sometimes they can't talk. There's still, they're still a little restrained there, right? Yeah. They're definitely restrained. Yeah. <laughs> it's written into some of their contracts. Right, they're restrained right, they that they talk can't about talk about it. Um, and I think the unfortunate part of that is our community, especially the young, people don't always get to see a lot of the things that uh, black people in the community are doing yeah. because they don't want to talk about it. They feel if they talk about it, they have a target on their back. They feel if they talk about it, the feds will come with the iris. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's unfortunate that they don't get to see a lot that we know. Yeah. Um, even some of the people I see in this, in this audience today are mm -hmm. doing some wonderful things and they just want to right. just keep it on the radar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for being here. Thank you. Absolutely.